England, August 1882, at the end of the Zulu Wars. At a country residence of Her Imperial Majesty Queen Victoria, amidst an unprecedented blaze of publicity and public interest in the Zulu people of Southern Africa, an historic meeting took place between the Queen, her political and military advisers, and the defeated and exiled King of the Zulus. He came with one aim in mind. He wanted his kingdom back. Your Majesty, His Highness Setswayo Kampande Zulu. His Highness thanks Her Imperial Majesty for the kind way he has been received in Great Britain. He hopes he is here, he says, to seal that pact of friendship once and for all. Your Majesty, the colonial office feels that any act of clemency would be a grave miscalculation of the Zulu threat. Martin, gentlemen, we're not merely concerned here today with a dispute over territorial borders or the revendications of a defeated king. We are called upon to defend Africa. It is, I believe, our sovereign duty, Martin, to safeguard the well-being of those of our countrymen who have settled in these distant lands, as well as that of the Kaffir tribes who look to us to bring peace to this land that has, for the past 60 years, been devastated one of the most formidable military empires ever created, the empire of Shaka Zulu. They are represented by his legitimate heir, King Chetswayo. Professor Bramston. Uh, Shaka Zulu, your majesty. Yes, the founder of the greater Zulu nation and the Zulu empire reigned from 1816 to 1828. Most definitely one of the greatest military geniuses in history. And certainly on the level of a Caesar or an Alexander the Great. Imagine, if you will, the prodigious feat accomplished by this 19th century African Achilles, Shaka Zulu. In less than 12 years, he transformed a handful of idyllic, relatively harmless herdsmen, who were by nature reluctant to engage in any form of warfare into a Spartan army of over 80,000 highly trained, ruthless warriors, extending his influence over most of Southeast Africa, an empire compatible in extension and might to that of Napoleon, and in treachery to that of Genghis Khan. Your Majesty, a gentleman, the war machine created by Shaka Zulu was so monolithic it has survived his death by almost half a century. Yes, yes, the crown has now defeated it, but that defeat is purely temporary. It can and will rise again and again if we do not stop it once and for all. And why? Because King Shaka was no ordinary mortal. He was a messiah, a god figure. Like an African Mephistopheles, he gave the Zulus glory in return for their souls. Wielding the forces of life and death on an endless battlefield of blood and carnage. Your, your Majesty. Ma'am, the threat is real and the decision before us clear. Therefore, the colonial office suggests that we constitute within the Zulu kingdom a progressive destruction and dislocation of the military and economic system. In so doing, we feel that the Zulu people, deprived of central leadership, will revert to the state of innocuous bliss that they enjoyed before the insane conditioning of Shaka. I tend to agree with Kimberley. If the Zulus won't bend, break them and be done with them. That's what I say. I rather think we'll be doing them a favor. A return to the plough should prove to be most therapeutic for these savages. Might even bless them with a hint of civilization. <laughs> Have I meant to translate, my lords? That won't be necessary, sir. We have so little in common. 
especially our concept of human respect. Thank you, your lordships, for your chivalry. Shaka Zulu mean to you? He was one of those rare men who had the courage to live his ideals and to instill his dreams into the hearts of his countrymen. That is precisely why we cannot give you back your realm. Shaka Zulu is more alive today than ever. His military strength still prevails. You are the king, but it is his spirit which rules your people. We are a practical woman, your highness. We will not form an alliance with the legend. And so it was that the empire created by Shaka Zulu some six decades earlier was disbanded. The king's territory subdivided and placed under British supervision. The resultant political mismanagement, continual white interference and the ensuing strife would effectively destroy the House of Shaka. From this time on, the Zulu people would only be able to dream of the dignity and the glory given them by their legendary king. This, then, is his story. The first time that Europeans began to feel the ripple effect of Shaka's war machine was in 1823. The Zulu king was at the height of his power. But like most military despots, Shaka had become both master and victim of his regime. His empire, having been born out of aggression, now required continued war action to keep it alive. successfully attacked and crushed all the immediate neighboring territories, uniting the defeated tribes into a single Zulu nation. But Shaka needed more victims, not only to satisfy his propensity for war, but to keep his huge army employed. And so regiments were sent further afield to enlarge and enrich the empire. And as they did so, those who did not wish to subject themselves to Zulu rule fled before the onslaught, often attacking others in their flight. The effects of this tremendous upheaval touched not only the people at which it was directed, but began to be felt by the British colonists at the Cape, who themselves were beginning to expand northwards. 
It was, therefore, inevitable that sooner or later the two empires would clash. As a result, the governor of the Cape Colony, Lord Charles Somerset, was prompted to send an urgent communique to London. To Lord Henry Barthes, His Majesty's Secretary of State for War and the Colonies. My Lord, in consequence to your Lordship's wish that I communicate in writing my deep concern for the future of the Crown's colony at the Cape of Good Hope, I beg leave to submit the following evidence regarding the menace of the Zulu nation under its king, Shaka Zulu. Since he ascended the throne of the Zulus in 1816, Shaka has forged one of the mightiest empires the African continent has ever known. In less than six years, his small, insignificant tribe has risen from obscurity and given its name to an all-powerful nation organized into a fearsome military machine. Shaka is known as a mass murderer, a depraved ogre, whose thirst for conquest knows no limits. He has deluged his country with innocent blood, disregarding the most sacred ties of affection, turning father against son, son against brother, in a bloodbath that defies description. I regret to inform your lordship that it has reached my attention that the threat of Shaka Zulu may soon be directed at the white settlers residing in the Crown's territories. If that were to happen, the Cape would find itself virtually defenseless and at the mercy of this ruthless barbarian. I respectfully submit this pressing matter to your lordship's judgment and that of his majesty. Signed, Sir Charles Somerset, Governor of the Cape Colony, Colonial Africa, Cape Town, January the 7th, 1823. <laughs> His Majesty the King is welcome after a pleasant night's rest. Lord Bathurst, His Majesty will see you first. Thank you. Oh, no, 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 my arm. Oh. Oh, oh. 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 Mm-mm. For you? Mm -hmm. Now go on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Your Majesty. Is it, Lord Henry? Sir. Your expression, Lord Henry, it bodes anything but a good morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Enough. Till tonight. <laughs> We are all attention, Lord Henry. It is the colonies, sir. We seem to be faced with a slight problem. Your office always seems to be having slight problems with the colonies, doesn't it, Lord Henry? Well, sir, it is the colonial office. 
And if one deals with melting pots, one is apt to be scorched once in a while. Well, who is it this time? The Canadians? No, sir. I'm happy to report that the remainder of North America is still under our thumb, so to speak. It is Africa, I'm afraid, sir. I have received a most alarming missive from Lord Somerset at the Cape. It concerns the Zulus, sir. The Zulus? Are you implying that the colonial office of the British Empire considers a tribe of savages running around in their birthday suits a problem? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh, what ineffable twaddle, Lord Henry. It is somewhat more than a tribe, sir. We are convinced that we are grips with a proper empire of a quarter of a million such birthday suits. Really? My, my, they, they do multiply, don't they? Like bunnies. Mm -hmm. Your Majesty. Your Majesty. Mm. It is possible that the Zulus will attack the Cape. If that should happen, we would have to deal with a very large number of these bunnies under the leadership of a March Hare by the name of Shaka. Well then, send on the reinforcements. We had thought of that, sir. But it is rather a long way to the Cape, 6,000 miles and four months by sea, to be precise. And I fear that by the time we have trained fresh troops in the art of native warfare and shipped them in Loco, it would be too late. Well then, transfer some of our Bengali troops from India. And lose India, sir. Then use mercenaries. Not to be trusted, I fear. Rubbish. Your own words, sir. Look out there, Lord Henry. What do you see falling? Rain, sir. And is that a frequent? occurrence in England. Rain falling, I mean. Alas, sir, all too frequent. And what do our colonies represent uh, for us? Sunshine, sir. Precisely. And it is your privilege to safeguard our sunshine. Thomas Jefferson. Drove my poor father out of his wits. I trust you will keep the same fate for me. Tend to the Zulus, Bathurst. Or it will be our sad task to find someone who can. Hmm? Your Majesty. armies were now fighting their way steadily south. The noisy victory celebrations echoing across the Cape's northern frontier ominously signifying Shaka's advance on the colonists. In Cape Town itself, at the Castle of Good Hope, Lord Charles Somerset anxiously awaited word from his superiors in London. But nothing appeared to be forthcoming, and time was running out. We have been blind, gentlemen. 
here we are trying to devise a way of confronting him with an entire regiment. And all we need is a solitary Caucasian. Uh, I'm afraid I... Uh, I don't follow you, sir. Let us pretend, for the sake of discourse, Worthing, that you are King Chaka. Let us also pretend, Wilkins, that you are that ruthless cutthroat so vividly described in Somerset's missive. Now, you are toying with the idea of attacking the whites, creatures you've never even set eyes on. Would that not make you slightly wary? I mean, it's all very well to fight against known odds, but against Lunarians, that is a very different kettle of fish. What if a Lunarian came to visit you at your court as a diplomat of sorts from the other world? And what if he said to you, now, hold on, Shaka, hold on, we know what you're up to now. Hear me out before you start tipping the scales of war. We have spears that spit fire, you know. See for yourself. Bang, bang. A lion drops dead at 600 paces. We also have a magic powder that can produce lightning and hollow logs that make thunder. You mean frighten him? In a word, Worthing, yes. Surely his spies will have told him about our cannons and our gunpowder? Yes, quite possibly. But these are not our only superior weapons. We have one other gentleman. Civilization. Years of tried and tested double talk. If we cannot soothe the savage beast, we can at least confuse him whilst we mount an effective military defense. Where do you suggest we locate a Lunarian disposed to go down there and uh, carry out this um, novel scheme? I think I may know the very man that you need, Worthing. Yes, I had the pleasure and honor of serving under him in His Majesty's Royal Navy. Lieutenant Francis George Farewell. A master of land and sea and just eccentric enough to perhaps want to do it. Just making sharp his acquaintance. That in itself should prove to be a major obstacle. Now, to begin with, thank you. Notice to use a nautical term, take the bearings of our problem. From reports that I was privileged to acquire on my last trip to Portuguese Delegada, it would appear that Sharka's capital, a place which the natives call Bulawayo, if I remember correctly, it lies somewhere in this vicinity. There are two ways of reaching it. Overland from the Cape, though I would exclude this option, considering that the only white man so far to attempt at the journey, a Dr. Cowan by name, was never heard of again. Which leaves us with an approach by sea. Landing somewhere along this coast, the wild coast of Natal. From a recent survey made by the Admiralty, the two most likely places for landing are St. Lucia Bay and Rio de Natal. Though that too could prove a problem, I think. In what way, Lieutenant? Well, no one's ever landed on that coast. And lived to brag about it. <laughs>
Clutie to see you, sir. Oh, what is it, Colonel? News from the north, sir. Shaka. What's that damn savage up to now? Well, sir, from what I've been able to sift from the reports, there is every reason to believe that the Zulus are now fighting right on the frontier. Are you sure? Yes, sir. I took the liberty of checking my sources. It spells trouble, sir. Any chance of those reinforcements from London? Mm, not likely, Colonel. However, the fact that no one has yet conquered that coast doesn't mean that I will. God knows I've been in some tight spots in my sailing days. Does that mean that you'll be joining us then, sir? Oh, most definitely, Tim. Yes, I would never miss a chance to serve my king. And collect the ivory. Did you say ivory, Lieutenant? Natal is said to be a paradise for ivory hunters. My dear Worthy, has it not occurred to you that I should need good and adventurous men to join me on this mission? Men who are willing and above all able to face the hazards of that coast, and more particularly Shah Ghazul. Experience has taught me that men of that calibre are very often greedy. What would you say to have me entice them? That you're doing it for the honour of your king, for the glory of Britannia? I need courage, Worthy, not patriotism. There's always a price on courage. And in this case, it should be paid in ivory. Farewell trading company. I rather like the sound of it, don't you? You said that there were two major problems. Now, the first, if I understand correctly, is reaching Sharko. What's the other? Why, the most obvious, Tim. Convincing the king of a primitive empire that our civilization is to be pure, when in fact we are not a match for him out there. Centuries of enlightenment do not necessarily make a country or its people militarily stronger. Indeed, as Attila the Hun proved, domestication is usually a weakening factor. No, no, fear is not the answer. I'm sure that Shark is more of a specialist in that than we could ever be. Now we just have to find another emotion to work with. Pride or? Vanity? Vanity, Francis. That is the greatest weakness of all men, whether they be Huns, Englishmen, or Zulus. Elizabeth! Elizabeth, let me introduce to you Mr. Worthing, Tim Wilkins, gentlemen, my wife. Enchanted, ma'am. Lieutenant, I had no idea you were married. <laughs> Most people find it hard to believe that my husband shares his life with anything but his dreams. And without the benefit of my wife's practical mind, my dreams would go hopelessly adrift. Then let's drink to the sunshine of the colonies. Lord Charles Somerset, Governor of the Cape Colony, Colonial Africa. My dear Lord Charles, I cannot begin to tell you how alarmed I was upon reading your missive of the 7th January Ultimo. I assure you that His Majesty and I share your deep concern for the Zulu threat as you so vividly outlined it. Unfortunately, due to the economic and military retrenchment policies the Crown has adopted since the end of the Napoleonic Wars, his Majesty's government is not at this time prepared to sanction the allocation of British troops. However, Sir Charles, after adequate deliberation, the Colonial Office has devised an alternate plan, the architect of which, Lieutenant Francis George Farewell of your acquaintance, the bearer of this missive. 
I trust your lordships will concede that Lieutenant Farewell's undertaking is entitled to every encouragement and assistance. Being at such hazard and if successful, likely to lead to the best possible solution of the problem at hand. Hmm. You? Sixty thousand ferocious Zulu warriors bent on attacking this colony. And what do I have from the crown to prevent them? Slaughtering every man, woman, and child in their path. A haughty letter of apology. And... No offense, Lieutenant. But you! Uh, I need a drink. Will you join me, Lieutenant? Be glad to, Sir Charles. In approximately two months' time, I intend to land a party of hand-picked men on the shores of Natal. Ostensibly, our presence there will be that of ivory traders. But trading will be merely a cover. My ultimate purpose will be to contact Shaka Zulu in order to secure an alliance with His Majesty King George. Alliances are made for civilized peoples, not savages. The whole idea is absurd. Even if you were successful in obtaining some sort of agreement, Shaka would never respect his end of the bargain. Their values of good and evil, life and death, are completely devoid of a moral code. Will their actions prove that? There is no defined perspective in their human relations. They're pagans, Lieutenant. And pagans lack reason. How do they, Reverend? Well, wasn't Cicero a pagan? Tacitus, Virgil, Homer, Julius Caesar, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. Do I need to continue? Those men were enlightened, Lieutenant. You can't possibly compare them to Shaka. He's a barbarian, an assassin. So was Charlemagne in his own very special way. I fail to see your point, Mr. Farewell. Lord Charles. The only chance the Crown has of preserving its territories in Africa or America or Asia is if it finally sheds its hypocrisy and starts treating others as equals. Well, I believe that that is the true Christian message. Wouldn't you agree, Reverend? Or does our moral code justify our own ends? Anyway. I intend to contact Shaka Zulu in order to negotiate an alliance with Britain. And in doing so, I can only hope that King Shaka will prove more reasonable than Pope Alexander Borgia would have been. I appreciate your idealism, Mr. Farewell. But you've obviously not been made aware of the situation in Africa. And I suspect but Mr. Fechter, our experienced Dutch resident, knows what I'm talking about. No, I don't feel that I can approve this absurd mission of you. But you have no choice, Lord Charles. Mr. Farewell's mandate came from Downing Street. And the Colonial Office requests your complete cooperation. Well, if you would excuse us, gentlemen, we didn't brave the high seas for four months in order to discuss these interesting points of history. Lord Charles, I have a crew to recruit. Good day, sir. 
Lieutenant, please excuse me, gentlemen. Mr. Farewell, may I walk with you? I want you to understand, Mr. Farewell, that you are planning to confront an awesome savagery. Thank you, Mr. Factor. I shall certainly heed your warning. Mr. Farewell, I want to go with you on your expedition. Also, I speak the Tulsa language, which is fairly similar to the Zulu language, reasonably well. In short, Mr. Farewell, I may be indispensable to your expedition. Perhaps you are. Is that an Englishman's way of saying that you'll take me? Perhaps. The situation at the frontier was now becoming almost untenable. With the Zulu onslaught pushing steadily south, the fleeing tribes were having to vie for what territory remained. Desperate, pitched battles frequented the northern borders, and the frontier farmers became increasingly nervous of the instability being caused by these violent encounters. They demanded urgent action from Lord Charles. Blast! Tell that damn farewell to do something and fast! Dismissed! Yes, sir. But Lieutenant Francis George Farewell was not to be pushed by the rantings of a disgruntled Lord Charles. Knowing the value of careful planning for an expedition such as he was putting together, he meticulously sought out people he knew would be of value to him, which brought him into contact with me. A meeting which, I might add, would change the course of my already eventful and extraordinary encounter with Africa. And indeed, would change my whole life. Hello, Mr. Finn. This is Lieutenant Farewell. We sent a message to your lodging about the possibility of joining Mr. Farewell's upcoming expedition to Natal. As my medical adjutant and superintendent of cargo, Mr. Factor tells me that your experience in both areas is quite extensive. I got the message, yes. They say it prevents infection, though, after four bouts of malaria and beginning to doubt its efficacy. Malaria? Is that what they have? That and sundry assortments of... yellow fever, dysentery, cholera... and diseases of the soul that are... far harder to diagnose and almost impossible to cure. Ah. It's only by the grace of God that any of these people will reach their as yet unknown destinations alive. Or maybe it's his will that they don't. So, Lieutenant, why are you venturing into those forsaken regions? What do you know about a man named Sharka? <laughs> Does that answer your question, Lieutenant? The Masani tribe, Humulus, Lubis, Unus, the Unguanis, countless others. The banished of Southeast Africa. Fleeing Shaka's spears, going straight into the arms of the white slave traders and the British troops on the borders of the Cape Colony. In a way, Lieutenant, they are the ultimate victims of recent history. If you'll favor my comparison, they are the wandering Jews of Africa. Fleeing the Pharaoh Shaka into the Babylonian captivity of slavery. Finn! If this empire is quite vast, and I'm told that it is, then the pharaoh must be giving his people something in return for their fidelity, or they'd all be wandering. 
Have you read Faust, Lieutenant? Marlowe's Bacon's Blessings or Goethe's. Touche. What was Faust given in return for his fidelity? Hmm. There's a legend, Lieutenant, amongst the native witch doctors, of a child, a prophetic child. They say he'll bring with him an era in which the name Amazulu will signify terror and death. Many people see Shaka as the incarnation of that prophecy. Oh, calm down, Finn. You're far too intelligent to believe in that kind of hocus pocus, surely. I've seen that child farewell. Ah, not in flesh and blood. In the eyes of the Fingos. In the eyes of these prisoners. Well then, tell me now, how do you suggest we go about stopping this diabolical child with a stake through the heart on the eve of the full moon? If there's no other way, Lieutenant, then we will have to kill him. Well, I don't think we're going to be taking many stakes with us, but um, possibly might find ways of doing the same thing less bloodily. You going to be with us? Are you going, Mr. Fector? Oh, yes, Mr. Finn. Then yes, Lieutenant. I may as well be with you. And may God help us. <laughs> Your name? Henry Ogle, sir. Yes, do sit down, Mr. Ogle. Thank you, sir. Are you know all about this expedition, do you? Pretty much, sir. Up the East Coast. Your trade, Mr. Ogle? Sailor, sir. But also useful on land. Served on decent ships? The best, sir. HMS Victory. Good. You're in. Now, in due course, you will be reporting to Mr. Fechter here, and he will begin to teach you basic Zulu. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next man, Tim, please. Tonino. Tonino who? Just a Tonino. Just Tonino? Oh. And um, where do you hail from, just Tonino? Italy. Italy? Do you? Your purpose, sir. For the adventure. I think we may be able to supply a little of that. Morning, sir. Your name? Popham, sir. I see. And Popham is your surname, presumably. No, sir. No, it's your Christian name. I'm not a Christian, sir. <laughs> John Kane, sir. 45. Qualified seaman. Can cook can handle a rifle as well as anybody. Valuable qualifications, sir. Prove them to us in your end. Thank you, sir. Tim, next man. Next. Zacharias Abrahams. Please come in, sir. Mr. Zacharias Abrahams, gentlemen. Mr. Abrahams. Well, now, you're not proposing to travel with us, sir, are you? I hope to, Mr. Finn. Mr. Abrahams is a, a leader of the uh, commercial community here in Cape Town. Mm. Mr. Abrahams, with the greatest respect to you, our journey will be arduous and we think dangerous. And it will probably be of considerable duration. Lieutenant, I have experienced over 60 uh, interesting years, but I am exceptionally sound in my health. Tell me, Mr. Abrams, how do you see your positive contribution? With 
all due respect to the rest of the expedition, sir, I would be the most successful trader on the east coast of Africa, not accepting the go-ahead Americans or the clever Arabs. Great Britain needs to develop territories for trade, and I would continue to be a valuable British subject.
Mr. Fakta. Go and tell him that we come in peace from the King of the Whites. Tell him that we want to meet Shaka. Go. This is what you want, this is what you want. 